India. Uh, this is my fourth year here, which means I'm just about scratching the surface and just about understanding what's going on. Uh, and many of my mentors along the way are here today. So it's just, it's just great to be uh, here with them. So uh, what I would like to do uh, is use the opportunity and the theme of this uh, conference to share some of the things that we've been learning together uh, at our little boys' school uh, on the edge of the Himalayas in the north of India, which is a peculiar context. And I realize that around the room we've got many different contexts. Um, so uh, when Ravi asked what I would talk about, I said I'd probably try and talk about remaining relevant. Because we ask ourselves at school a lot about what we're doing. Uh, are we doing the thing that's useful for our students and for the society that we serve? Because our mission since the school was founded in the 1930s is educating people, boys, to be ethical, just, wise and principled leaders to serve a meritocratic India. So serving India is the job, right? Creating great people is the job. Um, and then of course the theme of this conference is education for sustainability. And sustainability is part of a big dialogue in, in school. And I'm sure that it has many meanings around the room and that we are thinking of this, whether we are leading a classroom of children, whether we're leading a department in a school or a school itself, we're thinking about what sustainability means for us in our context. The rest of the theme is moving on from conformity to creativity. So I'll try and link what we've been learning and doing with, with these words, sustainability, conformity and creativity. I don't particularly see conformity and creativity on the same spectrum. I don't think one is the opposite of the other, and I think if you move from one, you don't reach the other. But I'll, I'll tell you how I think I've come to that conclusion as we move forward. So, when we think about sustainability at school, the first thing that we think of is environmental. Maybe that's the first thing that comes to mind at the moment too. Uh, we think of all of these things that we can try and do to be greener, uh, things to harvest water, which you either have none of or too much of here. It's, it's not in between, it seems. Uh, how we're using solar, how we're reducing waste all of the time, plastics particularly, and saving money is also part of that. We also think about our visual environment. And schools are responsible for managing their visual environment. Who's been to Derrida? Anyone been there recently? Hey, one of the things I notice when I walk down or drive down the street is that the visual environment is just full of stuff that's shouting at us. And our visual environments and schools need to look a little bit different from that if we're causing learning. But that kind of visual environment makes us think about consumerism, consumption, having stuff. And some of the schools that we work for and work in are full of people who are consumers. And in many ways, some of our parents are consumers too. They're buying the commodity of an education that they think is going to meet the needs of their children. Um, it's not entirely sustainable. I'll talk a bit about that in a minute. Um, we also think about the, the environment in which people are going to be learning the most. And that's got to be, we believe, an environment in which anyone can challenge and say anything. Because you're not going to be learning and pushing at boundaries. And it seems a little bit anti-conformity, but really that's one of the things that we're trying to nurture in school, is this approach to, uh, I suppose it's loyal dissent. If anyone's ever visited Westminster School in the UK, loyal dissent is one of their sort of mantras. It's what they believe in. We've got to try and maintain our curiosity and our desire to improve continuously. Conformity doesn't always allow that to happen. We have to push back against it. We also think, when, we, when we're talking about sustainability, about ecology. Now, I know I've, I've visited many schools that count themselves lucky to have a, a yard to play in. We're very lucky to have 72 acres that used to belong to the Forest Research Institute of India. Great ecology. But we have to make use of it. 
Uh, we have to make sure that the life that exists around us, in whatever way we can, is nurtured. So we may not have two and a half thousand trees or 600 species of plant, but we can do things to encourage the growth of insects, birds, and, and all sorts of other things in our surrounding area and use it. Um, you know, what we, we know lots of things uh, that have been imported to this country over the years and, and managed to get rid of some of those as well. But talking about what's indigenous is part of the dialogue that we have at school at the moment. This is something that's not indigenous and according to um, the UN has an economic opportunity cost of $91 billion in this country. When I visited uh, the South recently, I saw an abundance of this stuff, which is pushing out all sorts of other things. Indigenous and, co and contextual learning is becoming increasingly important for us. Uh, I don't know if you've read this book, Earth in Mind, by David Orr. He's a professor at Oberlin College, where he suggested, I remember reading it, I was horrified that kids will recognise 50 plus brand logos, but they won't recognise five leaves. Try testing it, it's absolutely true, uh, and it's horrifying. So part of our sustainability and ecology education is making sure that our students are able to recognize and value what's around them. He says in the book, if you don't recognize what's around you, we're heading for an ecological disaster. It seems familiar at the moment, doesn't it? Social sustainability is another thing that we worry about at school. Um, our schools are communities, aren't they? We have so many different stakeholders. Students, adults, alumni, my most interesting stakeholder group. It's lovely to see you, Sandy. Um, the negotiated order that exists, the work that you have to do to curate your social groups and keep them sustainable and working together. But many of us, I think, are working in the middle of a culture of separation. And indeed, I think some of the schools we work for are being chosen by parents who are deliberately separating their children from others. You might have followed a story in the UK recently where a playground was closed down to children from outside a particular community. And it made people reassess what is it that we're trying to build in society and what are we educating for? Choosing who your kids play with, the disparity that we have in this country is something that we have to prepare our children in schools to be part of solving because we can't lift up the kids in our schools without lifting everyone up uh, to meet them. Hierarchy as well is one of those beautiful challenges that I've learned more about in three and a half years in India than I did in 43 years before coming. And an awful lot of students maybe not in school, but in their home lives, experience and buy into this kind of conformity that was explored in Aisha, which is the lovely Bollywood uh, version of another film called Clueless, uh, about the way that we conform to the ideas of what's normal in, in, uh, in society. Um, our formal education is something that we need to deliberately look at growing social capital in. Um, I have friends who are doctors here who tell me about the experience of working in villages. There's a requirement on medical programs. But I have friends who are architects and engineers who are solving design problems and they've never been out in those same places. Wouldn't it be wonderful if that was part of what teacher training and development was? In fact, wouldn't it be wonderful if there was teacher training and development that, that really worked uh, for us? And again, we're living in a world that's increasingly individual, but the solutions we need are increasingly collaborative. And when you think about how education is assessed here in the majority, when you look at the way that we compete for things here, it's not growing collaborative social capital, which is another worry uh, that we try and handle in school. Personal sustainability is ever so important to us too. Uh, we know that thinking about well-being and grit and resilience is, you know, has grown in the global discourse, not just in schools, but in organisations 
uh, and in communities of retired people, as we live longer, loneliness is an issue. Loneliness is still an issue in schools. If you're that quirky kid in a school that thrives on competition, you're lonely. And we've got to make sure that we're educating all of our children to be first responders when it comes to mental health, so at least they can recognize when people are struggling. Of course, our staff have to do that too. Um, in, that, in that view of conformity, being authentic is something that we are really trying to push with our students as well. And this is one that they find incredibly difficult. They, they've left that, that epoch in their life where their parents' approval is what they desire, and now it's their friends' approval that they need. And that's a perfectly normal part of adolescent development, uh, but it's one that comes with challenges about authenticity. The other authenticity struggle is how they go about getting into universities. With, with our parallel system of coaching and university careers guidance and admission, you have a lot of kids who might be getting into universities based on something that you don't truly understand. I learned that last year when one kid accidentally shared his personal statement with the wrong university counsellor. That was our counsellor at school. And we learned all sorts of creative writing. Unfortunately, that wasn't the course he was applying for. Uh, and he wasn't able to live up to the offer that he then received as a result of his inauthenticity. And there's lovely explorations of authenticity that are around at the moment. If any of you have watched this beautiful series called Made in Heaven, Tara's journey through life was a struggle where she was looking at where she came from, what she wanted, how authentic she could be, and in the end, she didn't fit the world that she wanted to be part of. I think Karen came out of that series beautifully, didn't he? He was authentic all the way through and the most courageous person there. We're social animals and I think that what we have to be doing in schools is providing the opportunities and the experience through which our students and our teachers are learning how to work together, become happy, learning to play. I mean, if a lesson isn't full of elements of play, then you're reducing the learning in it. And it's a struggle to work with some teachers who believe that a lesson is about delivering pages 30 to 37 in that class. And of course, one of the other things that's tough in the teenage years is nurturing that love for yourself. Rather than looking for affirmation and support from those around you, we also have to be equipping our students to love themselves and to be kind to all of their weaknesses. They're as incomplete as the rest of us. Uh, and we are all learning that, I think. And actually just, just being prepared to talk about this kind of thing provides an awful lot of relief and support for many people. And we found that with our staff as well. Being prepared to talk about it, being prepared to be a little bit vulnerable without oversharing is something that we're trying to work on. If any of you follow Brené Brown on LinkedIn or on Netflix, her book Dare to Lead is a gorgeous read uh, and it provides some lovely exercises in it that are as suitable for grade 6, grade 12 and uh, teachers to learn from, I think. Another type of sustainability is this, this business that we're all in, right? Educational sustainability. Are we doing something that's actually going to benefit and be there in the long run? When I first came to this conference, where we talked about it in 2016, I think, uh, and met Sugata Mitra, we had this conversation about knowledge over understanding. What is it that gets tested in some of our exams here? It's not understanding. And if I think that you know, an understanding of English literature is knowing what Antonio said and where he was standing in, in Act 3, C 1. That, that, that's not literature. That's like thinking that Animal Farm is a book about animals on a farm. So we have to be teaching for understanding and for skills, um, which is why we've moved assessment boards uh, to a skills and process-based assessment board. Um, was that the bell or was that someone's glass, Sunday? That was a glass. 
good. Um, we, want to, we want to equip students to be able to think about stuff they've not seen before. And quite frankly, if you can get into you know, very competitive universities where you can only solve problems you've seen before, you're not going to be a useful doctor or an engineer. So again, it's, it's being prepared to take those risks and to take a guess. Have you ever tried asking a group of you know, kids in the 10th class or the 12th class who've done maths for years to estimate the volume of a light bulb? They're terrified because they don't know the answer and they don't know the equation for it. But I'm sure they know that a packet of juicy is you know, 200 mils and it must be roughly the same. But no one will tell you that. The danger of mugging up without understanding. Do you remember the speech in The Three Idiots? He had no idea he was calling his professor a rapist. It, it didn't go very well for him. But that's the danger of an education that's devoid of understanding. And we also have this parallel system of education. I can't believe that so many of our parents spend good money choosing a school and then spend good money buying an insurance policy because obviously the school's not good enough. It doesn't make any sense to me. We have to be providing the education that will leave people secure in the knowledge that that's what they need. But of course, we recognize that there are parents who are buying a branded education for their child. They want the logo, they want to be able to tell their friends where their kids go to school, and they don't actually understand what they're paying for in our schools. Okay. It's also the case that we are so competitive. Uh, I'm a member of the IPSC, along with many other people in the room. IPSC events and meetups are always competitive. Uh, until my friend Goodmeet and I put together a collaborative IPSC event a couple of weeks ago and had a wonderful time with kids from 16 schools sharing their problems and learning from each other. It was by far the best IPSC event that we've taken part in. We need to be doing these kind of things more. And I know the world is competitive and parents will say, as soon as you get out there, you are competing. I agree, but you are not competing alone. There are very few fields in which you are isolated and a lone wolf. Traditionally, that's been called teaching. Um, but you collaborate. You are always going to be on teams. That's what we have to be preparing our children for. That's, I think, what sustainable education looks like. We've got an operational sustainability that we worry about at school as well. Organizing our schools, universities, we worry about seniority and hierarchy, that's something that I think often gets in the way. I think that capacity, distributed leadership, trust and responsibility being given is far more useful and adopting this model of continuous improvement is what we're trying to do. It's very difficult because not everybody believes it when you do this. Oops. But you know, we, we have a lot of egos to deal with in organisations. Um, and I think that uh, um, that's actually something that we need to work at together in our institutions. And being free of corruption and personal gain is another thing that we have to worry about in our organizational sustainability. Because as we keep moving through this world and this India, uh, we've got to be doing this right. The number of compliances that we have to meet these days is just made easier when we do things properly. And it's an opportunity as a leader to exercise that moral leadership that other people can learn from. Again, sometimes it takes a lot of courage uh, to do that, and you upset people, but you know, it's the right thing to do. Economic sustainability, of course, we are all, we're all needing to make a surplus, uh, so that we can uh, do new and interesting things. And in whose long run are we interested in? My school's 85 years old, almost. There are schools here that are older. Our long run is what we're going to be doing down the line. And it's certainly the case that whatever we invest now 
it's going to pay back an awful lot more in the future. We always worry about where to put money in schools. The educational budget ought to be, after salaries, the largest budget in a school. Mind you, I've got a lot of greedy boys, so maybe a food budget, I suppose, as well. Uh, but where else do you put it? The reception area? Air-conditioned uh, corridors? Classrooms? Well, let's recognise that this is how much money you need to put into a high-performing classroom. You can make classrooms as lovely as you want, but the performance doesn't actually depend on the quality of the chairs and the tables. And we worry also, when we look at our sustainability, about the cost of entry. And we're making sure that we are waiving registration, admission and fees for all the people we can find at school that can earn that place. It's also true when we're looking for uh, staff as well. You, you do have to end up making sure that you pay them well enough. So it's about making sure that we're educating for tomorrow, for the future of our children. That's what sustainability means to us. You have to be courageous to do it. And I hope that we prepare experiences for our children through which they're going to learn all of these things. Now, conformity is, of course, something that we require. If you put adults with children, the adults will require conformity. I mean, children are frightening, right? That's why most of Stephen King's nasty characters are kids. If I think of The Shining, the most frightening thing there are the children. Uh, that's not why we go into education though, but this of course is why conformity has been needed over the years. Now, it's even true in schools that were established to be anti-establishment. So Dune was established in 1935 to prepare people for a soon to be free and democratic India. That's as anti-establishment as it got then. But now, my prefects believe in a hierarchy where they want their juniors to do certain things for them and to conform. And I wonder where that spirit went over the years. So conformity is also part of social organisations. We have to push back against that in our schools. Of course it's a risk. And our job in schools, whether we are leading a classroom or whether we lead the environment, is to make sure that we have the parameters, that we define the box within which we're working, and it might have walls around it, and that we prepare people to take risks within that. Conformity doesn't necessarily bring about learning, and that's why it can be dangerous in our schools. Definitions in textbooks, that's another kind of conformity. That's not an education. This, this is another kind of conformity. We have to help our children understand that they don't need to conform to this. And of course, conformity is the thing I think that Stanley Milgram was testing. It leads people to pull triggers and push buttons. And I, I know that some of you will remember, I was only three, at the, I was two at the time. But when Phnom Penh fell, in 1975, that was a type of conformity. Twelve years before that, Lee Kuan Yew had visited Phnom Penh because it was the model Asian city and he wanted Singapore to be like that. If you visit now, it's a different picture. Conformity has all sorts of dangers. I think that courage is the opposite of conformity in some senses and that's what, that's what our experiences in school have to grow in our teachers and in our students. But it has to, of course, be within our constraints. That's where conformity needs to stay, within our constraints, within our budget, within our walls sometimes, but what else can we do with it? And we can do all sorts of things here, and India is the most creative place I've ever been. And we need to give our students freedom to exercise some of that creativity in the context of our schools, in the situations where we are. And for many of our students, trying to teach them about that context is very important. Tribal communities are not failed attempts at becoming Delhiites. 
or Londoners or Parisians. They are the unique solution to the problem at that place and time. And I know that our boys will last five minutes if you put them in the jungle. Sometimes I feel reassured by that, but I think it's slightly pathetic. And helping them understand is what our job is. So that's what we think remaining relevant is. We can't go on any longer as we did in 1935. You can't get into the IITs with 77%. And we've got boys going to UC Berkeley whose feedback in their first week is you have to be kidding me on their essays. We have to prepare them better than that. And that's the world we live in. I hope over the course of the day and the weekend that we're actually going to learn more from everybody else here. This is what our students are up against. Well, actually, that's what they're up against. Sorry. I know. And we have to prepare them for that world. So, good luck everyone in the work that you do. It's the most valuable work in the world. And I hope that with all of the other speakers and sessions that we have today, we're going to learn more and more about that. Thank you. Thank you for the wonderful talk, Mr. Raghi. Could I please request Mr. Ravi Santlani to fel felicitate Mr. Raghi?